Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. Wanted to dive into some housing data. I think many of you understand that the current market is in a massive bubble. Uh, it's been expensive for a long time, though. Been expensive for, I would argue, many years. I started to sell my homes in the United States, the portfolio that I built in 2012. I started to sell in 2018 and I sold the last property. I announced it on this channel. I sold the last property about a year ago, something like that. And uh, the prices still went up after I sold. Of course, I was happy with that. No problem because I'm not trying to time the top or the bottom, I'm just trying to buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. And I was able to do that with my U.S. real estate. But uh, let's get into some more of the actual data. We understand that housing is in a bubble, but to what degree has it come down? What can we expect with the real estate market in nominal terms and real terms going into 2023? And to analyze some of the data and the charts, I want to go over to Zero Hedge and an article from someone who I think is incredibly underrated, Lance Roberts. And I would strongly suggest following him on Twitter. And also he teams up with my good buddy, Adam Taggart on the Wealthy On podcast. And I think they do kind of a market summary every Saturday, which I would strongly suggest. But Lance is, is really a sharp dude. And so let's go over this article that he posted on Zero Hedge. So the title is Current Housing Price Bubble Makes 2008 Look Quaint. <laughs> and yeah, uh, it is true that if you, and I, I love how people say, oh, we're not in a bubble, we're not in a bubble. But you ask them, well, were we in a bubble in 2006? Well, of course. Well, yeah, of course we were in a bubble then. Everybody knows that. Well, if we are if we were in a bubble in 2006, how are we not in a bubble now when a price is adjusted for inflation or even higher? Price to income ratios, higher. Uh, pretty much every single metric. And they said, well, supply is down. Well, okay, I get that. But that doesn't mean that that housing prices aren't uh, far higher relative to incomes, which I think is, is the most important factor, not the only factor, but definitely the most, uh, uh, the one that you have to prioritize when doing a proper analysis. That's for sure. Let's keep going, reading the article. So home prices started to correct as interest rates rose sharply in 2022. So he's talking about over the last three or four months. However, the real problem for home prices is still coming in 2023 as the standoff between sellers and buyers comes to a head. And going back to the argument that, oh, well, there's no supply, there's no supply, there's no supply. Yeah, I get that, but that doesn't mean that prices can't go down because what you're assuming is that demand is a constant. Or what you're assuming is that demand won't go down to the degree to which we would need to have prices go down, even though we have short supply. You're also assuming that if prices start to go down, it doesn't encourage or incentivize more selling, which uh, could increase that supply very quickly. Another thing that we've talked about on this channel all the time is the percentage of homes that are actually owned by investors private equity firms, as an example, that now they've got a choice. Do you hold a 5% yield with toilets and tenants? Or do you sell that gradually, that portfolio that you have, and take that cash flow and parlay it into something that you're far more comfortable with, or at least historically you have been, and that would just be treasuries that you can now, you know, six month T bill or whatever, you can get 4.5%. And if, that's a big if the Fed continues to raise rates and we see that six month go up, these funds are going to be even more incentivized to sell that real estate, the tenants and toilets in favor of something with maybe a better risk reward profile. So I could go on and on and on, but at the end of the day, it's all about supply and demand. <laughs> and I could argue how supply will could increase rather dramatically, even if they aren't building any new homes under 
let's say $500,000, it's safe to say starter homes. And that I agree. They're never going to build any more of those, uh, at least the ones that we would consider a starter home. The 1,500 square foot, three bed, two bath, 10,000 square foot lot, 5,000 square foot lot, et cetera. They ain't building any more of those. Uh, maybe in the future sometime, but uh, not in the immediate future. I can guarantee that because you can't build them at a profit, not even close. But again, that doesn't mean that we can't have more supply come online, more people needing to sell, especially if they lose their job, unemployment rate goes up, or they start to see their home equity slide. And then they have a shift in mindset where instead of their house, keeping their house, because I know I'm going to get rich, now all of a sudden, like, holy cow, I've got to sell my house or I'm going to get poor. Because 95% of my wealth is tied up, tied up in my own home equity. And I have to have that to survive. So either I sell now or I risk selling at a lower price in the future. It's a whole mental shift. And that shift happens slowly. It doesn't happen overnight. But once it once they shift from their house being an asset to their house being a liability, then uh, you can see how that supply side could change. Um, I guess the best way to think about it is that shift from looking at the house as an asset to a liability takes a long time. But once the shift happens, then supply can boom and prices can plummet. And uh, so it, it, it's, you know, how did you go bankrupt slowly and then kind of all at once? And I think that's what we might see in the housing market on the supply side of the equation. So Lance goes on to say, since the turn of the century, there have been two housing bubbles so since 2000, prices reaching levels of unaffordability not previously seen in the United States. And he's spot on right there. Uh, most people don't realize it, but when you adjust for inflation and the size of the house, prices really didn't increase for 100 years from 1900 all the way to the end of the 1990s. And we never really saw a bubble like we saw in 2006. And now we've got an even bigger one. So now going back to the article, such was, of course, due to lax lending policies, artificially low interest rates, luring financially unstable. I don't know if it's artificially low interest rate. That I don't want to get too far off on a topic, but I, were, were the rates artificially low? I don't know. We, we it, It's tough because you don't have anything to compare it to. It's a counterfactual. Like what would have market rates been? What, I, I, I just, who knows? But I think it's more to do with them creating moral hazard by backstopping long-term capital management and then just doubling down the GFC. But moving on here, such is, we all know that regardless of how we got to one, we had a massive housing bubble in 2006. Such is easily seen on the chart below. Okay. And so total mortgage debt in billions were reaching uh, household owners' equity and real estate level. So they've got a lot more equity, that's for sure. The current surge in home prices makes the previous bubble in 2008 look quaint by comparison. At the previous peak in 2007, the equity in people's homes was around $15 trillion while mortgage debt stood at nine. When the bubble popped, home prices collapsed, flipping homeowners' equity from positive to negative. Home equity is roughly 30 trillion, geez, while mortgage debt is 12. Wow, incredible spread, unlike anything. Yeah, so, you know, when we're sitting here trying to think about how this aggregate demand is possible that we see in the United States, how is it possible that you can't get a reservation at a restaurant? And we talk about stimmies, we talk about all these other things. We talk about the average checking account balance, yada, yada, yada. But let's look at home equity. And this is why I say so many times that the U.S. economy is really built on asset bubbles. You take away the asset bubbles and, and the economy is going to have a real tough time. I mean, just think if that home equity went just back down to where it was in 2007 to where you've got, uh, just let's subtract the equity with, with the uh, mortgage debt. 
So back then it was, you had a, a net positive of 6 trillion, and now you have a net positive of 18 trillion. That's a lot of purchasing power. <laughs> and, and a lot of purchasing power that is pretty much set at the margin, which is kind of scary when you think about it. And Lance gets into that in just a moment. So let's go on down the article. However, this time the surge in home prices wasn't due to a surge in lax underwriting. I would actually disagree with that. I, I, I think it, it, a lot of people think that, oh, back then you know, all you had to do is fog a mirror because we, you know, people only had to put down 5% or 1% or whatever it was. Yeah, but maybe not to the same degree, but if you look at the average down payment today, and I haven't done this research in a few months, but uh, if you look at it, it, it's very similar to what it was in 2005, 2006. Now, I'm not saying that lending standards are the same, but I, I am saying that if you look at the, the, the actual facts and the data, the average down payment is very similar. And then you go to the down payment that we saw prior to 98, and it was you know 20%. <laughs> so you wonder why we have such a, a, a big problem there. So I would, um, I'm not saying Lance is wrong, obviously, but I, I would look at some nuance there. So then he goes on, he looks at the median and average US home price. Now I would suggest that this is in nominal terms. This is not adjusted for inflation. At least I don't think so, just by scanning this chart really quick. Of course, many young millennials took that money and jumped into home. So they're talking about stimmies. The millennials went and bought a home. Of course, they rushed to buy a home. They overpay for it. Now they now regret it, which I've heard through a lot of studies that they've done with millennials. That now they're you know they're pissed that they couldn't buy a house. Now they're they're double pissed because they did buy a house and now the price is going down and they're looking back at 2008 and saying, you know, we could be next. So now he talks, Lance talks about at the margin here, how the price is set. The problem with much of the mainstream analysis is that it is based on the transactional side of housing, such only represents what is happening on, on the margin. Rather, the few people actively trying to buy and sell a home impact the data presented month monthly. So he points out that there's about 150 million homes or the housing stock in the United States, about 150 million. And at any given time, there's, let's just say 500,000 roughly of these homes, these housing units that are actually for sale. Okay. Well, whatever those, whatever those housing units clear at is going to set the price for the other call it hundred and 45 million or 149 million point five or whatever it is right so that's uh really a big deal so i think his argument is that we need to look at the data even deeper we need to scratch beneath the surface here so they say their baseline for this analysis would be the total number of units we just talked about that the chart below shows historical progression in the housing units and that is illustrated by this red line. The black line is the household estimates and the blue line is the total active population over 25 years. So this is your kind of your potential home buyers here, which you can see has flatlined substantially, or really flatlined quite literally since 2018. So not surprisingly, there are currently more houses, but they say this is usual because you know not everyone lives in the house and you've got investors, you've got people that own two houses and whatnot. So now he talks about there's three primary issues that lead to changes in the supply of housing. Prices rise to the point that sellers come into the market. So people want to sell because they want to cash in their home, home equity. Interest rates rise, pulling buyers out of the market. So we're talking about the supply side increasing. We're talking about, um, I guess, the supply relative to the demand increasing because of the demand side. And number three, an economic recession, which moves, which, which removes buyers due to job loss. 
And uh, yeah, I, I think those, I, I would agree with all three for sure. When those occur, transactions slow down and inventory rises sharply. Not surprisingly, since the article was written, uh, looks like an article they wrote in November 2020, two years later, the supply of homes has risen sharply. Such is often leading indicator recession. Huh. Yeah, so we talk about low supply, and that was true, but my goodness, that's changing quickly here. I mean, look at the supply we had at the, let's call it 2005, 2006. I mean, that was 12 months of the supply of new homes, where now we're at 10 months. I mean, getting pretty darn close. Now, this is new homes, though. So I think, to be fair, we'd have to look at all homes for sale or all housing stock. And and, and that, I, I think, may give us a different perspective. So they go on to say that another drag on prices in the new year will continue to inventory coming on market as existing homeowners will try to sell their homes. And we talked about this. More inventory and few buyers will equate to further price drops coming this year. Talk about 2023. And then they go over this chart that is most telling, I'm reading right from the article, of why home prices will fall further in the coming year is a composite index of everything involved in the housing activity. It compiles new and existing home sales, permits, housing starts. The index was rebased to 100 in 1999. The run-up in activity index in 2007 was a function, as noted above, lax lending standards led to the collapse of 2008. But look at where we are today. Activity is even higher measured by this metric uh, than it was in 2006 at the last peak. Even now with the slowdown, it's still higher than it was in the peak in 2006. The reversion in home prices that has begun will likely continue as that excess liquidity continues to leave the economic system. The drain of liquidity coupled with higher interest rates, less monetary accommodation will drag home prices lower. As that occurs, the home equity that many new home buyers had in their homes will dissipate as home ownership costs continue. So he's talking about home ownership costs, maintenance, taxes, um, insurance. I mean, these things are all going to go up while at the same time, the price could flatline or even come down when you adjust for inflation, especially when you adjust for inflation. And that's going to incentivize more and more people to sell because like you saw in, in those first statistics, there's so much home equity. This represents the majority of most people's net worth, especially these baby boomers that really can't afford to play around with their current portfolio. Uh, they can't go back to work, or at least they don't want to go back to work. They have to be as, as risk averse as possible. They can't roll the dice with their home equity. Again, once that mind shift, once that psychological mind shift occurs in society, where the majority of people believe that home prices are going to continue to go down as opposed to continue to go up, you get, I, I mean, people are, it, it's like people are going to be running for the door. And uh, they don't want to play that financial game of musical chairs. So they just run for the exits. And um, you could go from nobody wanting to sell to everybody wanting to sell. He concludes by saying there isn't a vast wasteland of bag bad mortgages sitting on the books as we saw in 2008. I, uh, maybe, I mean, yeah, probably not like 2008, but I mean, keep in mind during the depths of the GFC, the uh, default rate for mortgages went from like 1.5% up to like 4.5 or 5.5. 
you know, we tend to think that default rates went from like 1.5% up to like 55%. And that's not true. That's absolutely not true. It, it, they only went up by about 4%. Again, from maybe four, I, I mean, I don't have the chart in front of me, but if my memory serves me right, because I've done several whiteboard videos on this, you're looking at an increase from about 1.5 to let's say 5.5. Or I, it might even have been 4.5. So uh, not that much. So is it any stretch or is it a, a, is it a huge stretch to think that we couldn't see default rates in 2023 go from 1.5 up to 4.5, go up by 4%? I mean, I, I think that's definitely possible. I don't know if it's probable, but uh, definitely above uh, a zero probability, that's for sure. And it's definitely probable enough to where I think we really got to factor that into the equation. So finally here, not only are further home prices, price declines possible, but it is also probable they could be deeper than many currently expect. So again, this was on Zero Hedge, guys, a ton of awesome charts. And it's always good information from, from Lance Roberts, that's for sure. So if you want to go over there and check it out, I would strongly suggest reading the whole article and also listening to Lance on Adam's podcast, Wealthion, or maybe following him on Twitter. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. As always, make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism, and we'll see you in the next video.